we just passed through Tuesday, Fat Tuesday. <laughs> Fat Tuesday, don't you just love that name? Fat Tuesday, which is the name, I didn't know uh, Fat Tuesday and Mardi Gras was French for Fat Tuesday. Who, who else knew that? Somebody knew that besides me? I mean, I just learned it. So that's what it means in French. Mardi Gras means Fat Tuesday. And then after Fat Tuesday comes Ash Wednesday. Now, Fat Tuesday, okay, was really a long time ago. It wasn't just to go down to New Orleans and have a wild time throwing beads. It was really to eat up all the fat in your house uh, because you were about to go into a time of fasting. So things like butter and, and meat and all that kind of stuff, you were about to go into a serious time of fasting. And then it became just fish on Friday for some people. And then it became for Lent, I'm going to give up something for Lent. So some of you might be practicing that for the days leading up to Resurrection Sunday, Easter. You might be practicing something of giving up some type of repentance. It's, it's in preparation for that. And, and it's a good thing. We look at Job, uh, Job 42, five through six. I don't have this in the bulletin because I'm just starting with this. In Job 42, verses five through six, it says, I had heard you, by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye sees you. Therefore, I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. See, because this is what happens. Job shows us that what happens when we see God, when we see God and see ourselves, he transforms our lives. He transforms our lives. Repentance, that's what that is a transforming of our life, a turning from what you do. And so when we're reflecting at this time, and maybe you reflected before this time, transformation usually will take on some kind of crisis where you begin to see yourself, when you begin to see things that God shows you. We can either embrace it, right? Or we can turn away from it. That's the beauty of it. It's your choice. The Lord is not going to force you. Our prayer today is that you receive a, a new revelation during this time leading up to Resurrection Sunday, the, the most important day of the year, really, because this is when it all happened, that Jesus came and he, he saved us. Because if he didn't, if the Lord didn't send him, all this is for, for not, this is nothing, okay? It, 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 when people don't believe that it happened, but we know that it did. And may the crisis that God brings you to during this time as you reflect on your life, and I, and I ask that you do take the time, may, may that, that aha moment that God gives you during this time, maybe in more than one aspect of your life, may it help transform you. There was a prayer written by a theologian um, thousands of years ago. AD 339, he lived, he was born and died in 397. His name was Ambrose of Milan. And this is the prayer I want to start with today. So go ahead and bow your heads because a prayer is a good prayer, even through the centuries. Let's pray. O Lord, who has mercy upon all, take away from me my sins and mercifully kindle in me the fire of thy Holy Spirit. Take away from me the heart of stone and give me a heart of flesh, a heart of love to adore thee, a heart to delight in thee to follow and enjoy thee, for Christ's sake, amen. Isn't that a great prayer? Amen, Lord. We pray that prayer today. The scripture today takes us to Mark 1, which you're going to say sounds familiar, Tamar. It sounds familiar. We, weren't we in Mark 1 just a minute ago? Yes, we were. But we're going to look at a different aspect of this, verses 9 through 15. So I want you, if you have your Bible or you have your iPhone or your iPad or whatever you're using to look at today, you always want to confirm that what I'm reading is correct, okay? Because um, I expect, you know, not to lead you astray, but if you hear something wrong, you need to, come on, correct me on it. And we're going to go to verse nine, and this is going to sound familiar because we already talked about the baptism of Jesus a few weeks ago. So I'm just going to refresh our memory. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the, in the Jordan. Verse 10, and when he came up out of the water, immediately he saw the heavens being torn open and the spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, you are my beloved son, with you I am well pleased. Verse 12, 
the spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness. And he was in the wilderness 40 days being tempted by Satan. And he was with the wild animals and the angels were ministering to him. Verse 14, now after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee proclaiming the gospel of God and saying the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Don't you just love Mark? Mark will get to the point so fast and we actually don't know uh, which Mark this was. I, I looked up to see which Mark is this? Who is this Mark? And they say they're not sure of the Mark who wrote this. So we're just gonna call him Mark because it's Mark, okay? He gets to the point faster than in Matthew when they talk about this. Um, he uses just two verses to say what happened with Jesus. Okay, he gives it in bullet points. He just goes like this in the middle of the bullet point. Instead of using half a chapter, he just uses a few sentences. But in the middle of it, he takes a moment to show us a disturbing image of Jesus Christ alone in the desert. But let's get to the point. He says, Jesus appears in, in his baptized. That's the first thing he says. Jesus appears and is baptized, starts his ministry, wrestle, wrestles with the devil, and calls his first disciples all in the first half of the first chapter. That's what Mark does. First half of the first chapter, all that happens. And if you're not careful, you'll skip over the important parts of it. In the middle of these points, this is where we're going to take note. He shows us Christ alone in the desert among wild animals, hence the picture of me. The closest thing I could get to the desert was in Egypt, um, the pyramids of Egypt. So I wanted you to have that picture of the desert among wild animals in the wilderness place where there is no shelter. Jesus is where the harsh environment could devour him at any moment. So as we go to 13, it says, and he was in the wilderness 40 days being tempted by Satan and he was with the wild animals and the angels were ministering to him. As I said before, Matthew and Luke write about Jesus and Satan at length and they use over a dozen verses to do it. Mark gives it shortly to us like this, but he gives us the picture of Jesus going in, meeting up the, his old enemy, his old nemesis on enemy turf loneliness, fatigue, all of that taking place. So let's look at the part, and he was in the wilderness. Have you ever been to the desert? I have not, I don't think. Well, I went through Las Vegas once and that's kind of deserty. So have you ever been in the desert or in the heart of the jungle? Anybody ever been to a jungle? So you can just nod your heads because I'm not expecting you to unmute and tell me. Or maybe you've been on a cruise. Okay, where you lose sight of the land. Now, Lenny and I have been on a cruise and um, I just think it's so pretty to look out at the water until I start thinking about if somebody pushes me off or I accidentally fall in, there is nowhere for me to go but underwater because I'm not that great of a swimmer. It's like, okay, I'll be done for because there's no land in sight. It's very desolate, absolutely nothing but water. I'm done. These, these, these landscapes, that, it's so beautiful though, isn't it? Those of you who've been on a cruise or those who've been in the desert, even looking at it, it can be beautiful. Or if you're in like a, a, a wilderness, it's beautiful out there. But, but here's, here's the other fact, it can also kill you at any moment. One false move, I, I know that's hateful to say, right? One, one false move or, or one bite by a rattlesnake or somebody tips you over into the ocean a broken compass in the desert and you lose your way. It's over, no one hears from you again. That's the fascinating power of places like this. Uh, nothing that we have, our, our technology can fail us. Don't have enough money to stand up against it. Nature reminds us because as ancient as it is, as ancient as it is, it's gonna be here when you leave and sometimes it doesn't even want you here. Think about that. Being in the wilderness alone can be one of the most frightening experiences. But don't start to feel sorry for Jesus. Don't feel sorry for him. Let's focus on the first part of the passage that in today that we talked about a few weeks ago. Jesus was preparing himself to go into the wilderness. When uh, the Lord said to him, you are my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. All right. 
time to go. If I know my father is with me, the wilderness will hold no fear for me, will hold no fear. And when he saw the heavens open up and the dove come down, right away we, we realized, and we talked about before, this is no ordinary baptism. And this is no ordinary person being baptized. Now remember, when he went down, we went down. When he came up, we came up. It's not ordinary for us either. So if you're walking through a wilderness right now, hear me, because this is for you. Jesus saw the spirit descending on him. We can only speculate either others saw it or only he saw it, but a disciple wrote it down or he told the disciples, but it was written down. And that is the only part of the experience that was written down. And a voice came from heaven, you're my beloved son and I am well pleased. Look at that affirmation. Can you imagine God saying that to you? You probably say, mm, he's not well pleased with me because I blank, blank, blank. Remember who's in you, Jesus. Jesus has made us right with God. He's made us right. And if there was, if there had been any doubt in Jesus's mind, and we're not saying that there was, can you imagine? But he was human, right? But he always turned to his father for strength. It should have disappeared at the sound of that voice saying, you are my beloved. I'm delighted in you. So I think sometimes I said before, we have to say that to ourselves. God has said that to us. I'm delighted in you. We can only imagine what that did for Jesus's confidence. It was these words ringing in his ears as he came out of that water, full of the knowledge of his identity. And he was confident in his father's love. I think that's where we fall short, right? We're not always confident. So when we walk into a wilderness time, we believe, oh Lord, are you with me? Cause uh, it's kind of dark. It's kind of desolate here. I'm about to fall off on, on the sea. Lord, are you here? Now, don't you love this part in verse 12? And I'm reading from the English Standard Version. The spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness. I want you to catch that word. Listen for the words, drove him out into the wilderness. Other translations use different words. The spirit compelled him, sent him, impelled him, or led Jesus out into the wilderness. The implication is this, he was not forced to go and he didn't go against his will. He didn't go against his will. The spirit led him to a divine appointment. Going into the wilderness and being tempted by Satan was no accident for Jesus. It was part of the plan. So those wilderness moments you go into, I want you to hear me when I say this. Is there a scheduled appointment for you that you're fighting? When you come out of this appointment, God has given you something that you need to move on. So don't, don't let go of these wilderness moments too soon or give up in the wilderness. And when he was in the wilderness 40 days and tempted by Satan, and he was with the wild animals and the angels were ministering to him. That was in Mark 13. That's pretty brief, right? The other gospel writers, again, much more time. Jesus was in the wilderness. And that's such a biblical term when they say in, in the wilderness. Uh, and it's unlike modern days. Most of the world, uh, what they describe as a wilderness is untamed, dangerous, sometimes lethal, even to the point of being beautiful. Most of us will be scared to go into the wilderness. I've said that before, we'd be scared for an extended period of time, unless we had great camping gear and lots of food and the promise of a phone that works. But we can't assume that again of Jesus. He knew, he knew. He went into the wilderness with full confidence. He just heard the voice of his father. So he had that confidence. It's similar to going into the wilderness and talking about when we are to fulfill the great commission, go ye therefore into all the world, preaching the gospel unto everyone. I have commanded you. We go with the confidence of Jesus. We find that in Mark 28 uh, verses 18 through 20. What was Jesus doing in the wilderness? Why was he compelled to go there? Only part of it was the meetup with uh, Satan. So he was spending time with his father, spending time. He was preparing for his ministry and he was defeating the enemy as he prepared for that ministry. 
Can you imagine, is God doing that with you? Are you taking time to be prepared in 2021? I talked about this at the beginning in January. Are you taking time to be prepared in 2021 for what God has in store for you? Are you prepared for it? Or are you just waiting for it to happen haphazard? Are you spending time with your father? Are you preparing for the ministry that he's given you? And it doesn't matter what age you are. You're not here just to soak up Jesus and keep it to yourself. You're here to reach out to others and to show who Jesus is. Could you imagine if everyone was doing the job that we were sent here to do? Oh, amen, amen, amen. 40 days big number. You find that 40 is a big, huge number in the Bible. Pay attention to that when they call on that 40 days. Let's take a step back and look at it. Jesus passes, uh, Jesus passes through the waters and goes into the desert to wonder. Here's what I found out. Jesus is replaying the story of Israel here. Remember Israel? How many days did they wonder? Not days, years, 40 years after they passed through the Red Sea. Jesus passed through the water. They passed through the Red Sea. They wandered in the desert for 40 years before entering the promised land. You'll see several times in the gospels, Jesus replaying Israel's story. Only this time it ends in eternal victory. Israel's story started with Abraham, then Isaac and Jacob, but the extended family became Israel in the desert. Listen to that. Their identity as God's people was solidified in the difficult time in their tents in the middle of nowhere. Is God solidifying something in you during this time in your life? The Lord let us know something here. Our inadequacy, our inaptness and need for him was proven in the desert once and is fulfilled in the desert again. Jesus redeems the journey through the wilderness. We're redeemed. Israel spent 40 years because of their unbelief in um, who God was. 40 years because they didn't believe. What was he doing, uh, what he was doing for them? Jesus spent 40 days knowing who he was and knowing God is for him. Isn't that good news for you? God is for you. He rewrote the story of God's beloved. Now think about this in your own life. Have you seen that in your own life? How Jesus will step into your story. He doesn't destroy it and he doesn't start it over. He just rewrites it as you're going. He rewrites your story. Hmm. Stop. One example. Um, Close at hand is the Apostle Paul. After receiving the best training and, and writing and speaking and arguing, Saul found himself suddenly meeting Jesus. And then God rewrote Saul's story. Blinded him, remember? And then he used all of his gifts, all of Paul's gifts for the writing and speaking and arguing, reasoning, his reasoning for his glory and the gospel. He is rewriting your story because you are his beloved. All those talents and gifts he's given you aren't just so you can go out and give glory to yourself. It's to give him glory. Now let's go to the part where he's being tempted by Satan. Jesus heard a familiar voice as he walked over there in the wilderness. He knew the enemy's voice. You think he was surprised? The enemy of God, God's plan, God's people, and of course, God's son. That's who the enemy is the enemy of everything that stands for God. So you think he's going to give you a break? You're standing against him by just your very belief. But Mark doesn't spend any time detailing the temptations like they did in the others. He just makes a matter of fact statement. Jesus was tempted by the enemy. Some like to say it was a battle. Let's get this straight. Some say Jesus battled the enemy. <laughs> There was no battle. There was no battle. Jesus was in control from the very beginning. He was the beloved son of God. There was no battle. And Satan is the self, is the self-proclaimed enemy of God. 
There was no ensuing battle. There was simply a matter of putting the enemy in his place. Can we get that in our heads? There is no battle. The battle's already been won by Jesus as he came up from the grave, as, it, as we'll picture in the up and coming weeks, a little over 40 days from now. There is no battle. Mark is looking back on this event and simply states the obvious. Satan tried and failed. End of story. Oh, if we can take that attitude as we face things in our life, you can try, but you will not win. I don't have to talk to you. I'm going to let Jesus fight this battle for me. Now, he was with wild animals. Now, get this. He was with the wild animals. Here again, he uses the, the word to con convey the reality that the wilderness is full of wild animals, lions and tigers and bears, oh my. And they look like different things really against us. It looks like different things against us. All those things that, that come against us when we're in our wilderness time that we think we can't make it. 40 nights with wild animals, 40 nights. Some of us have spent a lifetime because we're trying to fight this battle ourselves, and we're not aware that we turn that over to Jesus and, and there is no battle. Now, he was showing something that we need to catch. He was showing that Jesus was protected. And so are we. Jesus was protected. There were wild animals. You know how God can shut the mouth of, of the accuser? He can shut off things that are up against you also. You are protected during this time in the wilderness. As a result, he trusted his father, Jesus did, from all the elements of the wilderness. Do you trust God while you're walking through your wilderness? Do we? When we know our true identity as a dear beloved child of God, and yes, I keep repeating that. Are you sick of hearing it? Because I think we need to hear it a little more. He loves you. You are a beloved child of his. Then we know that we're in the hand of God and we can face our own wilderness experience in the full confidence that God is always in control. No matter what is the thirst or what is the threat that keeps coming to us, we can proclaim in the name of Jesus that we don't have to face that alone and temptations are real, but we're led away by our own thoughts, our own things that we just want to get our hands on. Our own things that have tempted us. That's what we're being led. Jesus was different now. Full confidence, prepared to go into it. And, and the part where it says, and the angels were ministering to him. And that's the last brief description he gives. Jesus was tended to by heavenly power during the ordeal. And so can we. He was cared for and he was watched over. And he was never out of the father's eyes. But here's what I want you to notice, my friends. Notice that he was also not taken out of the situation. And neither are we. The wild animals and the angels are both with him there, equal parts, like death and the resurrection, like joy and pain, just like real life. Like Jesus, we're never alone in the desert. Wild animals may surround us at times, but we're also ministered to by the angels, letting us know God is always with us. And then the last part in the scripture where it says, now after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee, um, proclaiming the gospel of God and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. Remember how I told you Jesus got up and went on to his next assignment when he was baptized. Well, now that he got out of the wilderness, he went on to do what he was scheduled to do, what he was meant to do. The spirit led him into the ministry to prepare, led him into the ministry to prepare for ministry. He went in with full confidence and assurance, and he came out on mission and purpose. So the wilderness that you're going through right now, are you ready to come out? And are you ready to get to work? Let's get to work. Because there's still work to be done. When you are in your wilderness, remember who is there with you and get on mission when you come out. Amen. Father in heaven, we come before you, Lord. We are glorified. Uh, 
No, you are glorified through the praise that we are just willing to give you, God. Just may we never mistake our wilderness times for times of being left alone by you. But Lord, may we look at these times in the wilderness as time of being prepared. And may we take this time leading up to Resurrection Sunday, Easter Sunday, Lord, as a time that you show us the things within ourselves as we're either choosing to fast or choosing to reflect or choosing to give something up or whatever it may be, Lord, show us what you need us to see. And Lord, help us to use that time of crisis to embrace you, embrace you more than we embrace our lack. For we lack nothing with you in us. We thank you, Lord, for your word. We thank you for your sacrifice, Lord Jesus. And we thank you for thinking enough, uh, Lord, of us to, to send a savior. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.